Um, well, thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today to talk, just to maybe introduce some of the newer immunotherapies that are that we are working in and sort of found, form the foundation for our discussion with the panel a little later about the future of immunotherapy. Um, so as Jill told you, uh, immunotherapy is not new in the treatment of lung cancer. It's been around for many, many years, and it sort of relies on the principle that we all think should be the way we treat cancer, to use our own body's natural defenses, um, to recognize something abnormal and get rid of it. That's what we would like our immune systems to be doing for any cancer cell or any abnormal cell in our body. This is just a diagram sort of showing you a T cell attacking a cancer cell. Um, we know that T cells recognize abnormal cells or recognize cancer cells by virtue of the fact that uh, new, oh, abnormal things in your body, bacteria, viruses, and also cancer cells can express abnormal proteins on their cell surface, which can then serve as a recognition point for T cells. And cancer cells, because they are abnormal, often express abnormal um, pieces of protein that your normal cells wouldn't. So it seems like an a opportunity ripe for the taking, and it's been understood for many, many years that this would be an opportunity for therapy. Uh, I think it's really gained new life because of the recent successes we've seen after many years of maybe not such successful efforts. So I would say there are two general strategies we think of, or two kind of classes of types of immunotherapy. One I would call active immunotherapy, which is really trying to boost the offensive attack of uh, T cells increase or stimulate T cell activation um, and increase the number and function of T cells capable of recognizing and attacking tumor cells. The other, which is where I think we've seen the most uh, recent, or some of this recent success, is in actually blocking the uh, defense that uh, cancers use to defend themselves against your immune system. We know that one of the ways that cancers can invade the immune system is that they can use your own body systems to uh, turn off the immune response. They, uh, what, some of these new therapies are really in, interfering with the inhibitory pathways at the site of the tumor that resist T cell attack. Uh, so really what we're trying to do is block the blockade of T cell inhibition that happens at the tumor level. And some of those drugs that we'll talk about include things like PD-1 inhibitors and CTLA-4 inhibitors. So as, as we were talking about, immunotherapy is certainly not new to the field of lung cancer. Uh, one of the earlier successes that we have seen is with the use of a stimulatory kind of or active uh, immunotherapy, IL-12, which has a historically some success in renal cell cancers and melanoma. And I use this diagram to sort of point out um, a concept that we think about as um, researchers in lung cancer, which is this tail of the curve, that unfortunately all too often we see that patients with metastatic cancer die of their cancer. And that what we really want to see is that people get onto this, what we call a tail of the curve, people who are long-term survivors of cancer, and they survive for many years after treatment of cancer. And we did see this with the use of IL-12. It's still used in, in, in some cases, but it's only a very small proportion of patients that get benefit, and only in these cancer types where we know that there's historically a lot of immune cells within the tumor. And it's hard to predict who will get benefit, and it's hard to be really using it broadly for the benefit of a lot of people. Vaccines also have a long history in cancer therapy, and although there is certainly some success with um, uh, preventing cancer development from viruses that can uh, pr promote cancer development, there's really been many, many trials, but few successes in actually using vaccines for treatment. Although, again, in principle, what we would really like to be doing with immunotherapy is you know, stimulating your immune system to attack cancer cells, and that's what vaccines can do. You basically amplify an immune response and hope that it will be, lead to sustained tumor immunity, is what we would call it, which is how, what we get from doing, giving vaccines for um, viruses and other uh, infectious illnesses is that we generate long-term immunity to protect you from that. We know that um, there are multiple signals that regulate T cell activation, that your immune response is something that's very tightly regulated in your body. You don't want an overactive immune response, nor do you want an underactive immune response. So there are many features of T cell interactions with abnormal cells that regulate whether they're truly going to attack and kill that cell or not. So on the top is sort of a diagram of the signal of recognition that this is something abnormal, the T cell receptor interacting with an, uh, an antigen expressed on a cell surface. But there are other signals. Signal two is something that can often occur within lymph nodes, which is actually regulates that immune response. That's what CTLA-4, um, which is a, a, a down-regulation signal and sort of turns off the immune cell response, can do in the level of the lymph nodes. And that's the principle behind uh, a therapy called ipilimumab, 
um, which is an approved therapy in melanoma, uh, to block that interaction and enhance the potential for T cells to attack tumor cells. But where we've really seen success across oncology in many different tumor types is in that signal three, uh, which really blocks an interaction between a protein on immune cells called PD-1, or program DEF-1, and PD-L-1, um, which is a ligand or a protein that interacts with the, uh, expressed on other cells, other immune cells and tumor cells, which can basically interact with the PD-1 on immune cells and turn off the immune cells and shut them off. Um, and so that's one of the ways that we think that cancers can effectively evade your immune response is that even if you have immune cells that are trying to kill them, the tumor cell expresses, can express uh, these proteins called PDL1, which can basically effectively block that attack. So um, this is a slide from one of my colleagues, but in the field of lung cancer where Prior to immunotherapy, the best successes we had were with targeted therapies, which for a subset of patients can be very effective because they really target one thing. And for some patients, there's sort of one driver of cancer growth. And he used this analogy of a car, which I think is um, helpful to think about. If you think about what chemotherapy does in cancers, and in this case in lung cancer, it's sort of like pouring acid over a car. It's a very sledgehammer approach. It just sort of kills... Um, bad things, but it also kills good things. Targeted therapies we were very excited about because they're very directed. They sort of focus on the driver and the driver's seat and target specifically that. Um, but we know that those ultimately, that people ultimately develop resistance even to targeted therapies, and for many people, targeted therapies are not useful because there's not just one driver of cancer growth. Um, sorry, I'm going to skip past that. But when you think about how immunotherapy works, you have to sort of invoke that what a, what a car has um, in this analogy is a sort of a force field around it, that, this, that high levels of PDL1 expression or other modifications of the environment right around the tumor sort of protect it like a fort from T cell attack. And what immunotherapies such as, PDL, um, such as PD1 do is, inter, is uh, block this interaction of PDL1 and PD1, which is sort of keeping this force field intact so that you can get the T cells into the tumor, kill the tumor. And ultimately, I think that's where we hope for more success for more people. The problem is, as many of you know, that, that this type of approach does not work for all patients. In fact, in lung cancer, and I would say for many of the solid tumors where we've used these drugs, the percentage of patients who benefit from PD-1 or PD-L1 therapy as a single type of therapy, a monotherapy, is only about 20% or less. In lung cancer, which is my uh, field, we know that there are some characteristics of patients who are more likely to get benefit. Smokers seem to get more benefit than non-smokers. We, we are not sure of 100% why, but we think this is probably related to the fact that smokers sometimes don't have a single driver of cancer growth, that there may be many different changes in the cancer cells that are driving the cancer growth, but those many different changes also make the cancer cells more recognizable to the immune system. And we do know that where immunotherapies, or PD-1 inhibitors specifically, have been most successful is in those cancer types that have what we call a high mutational load or a burden of genetic changes within the tumor. We also know that some patients' tumors express high levels of this protein PDL1, and at least in lung cancer, high levels of PDL1 can be a predictive marker for somebody who's more likely to benefit. And in fact, just within the last year, we have a subset of patients for whom now immunotherapy or PD1 inhibition has replaced chemotherapy as our standard of care because we know that if you have high levels, you're more likely to benefit from this therapy than with chemotherapy. But still, we have very imperfect biomarkers. These don't really predict, um, you know, they don't, they're not black and white predictors that these are likely to work or not. And with the advent of newer combinations of therapies, too, we probably need better biomarkers. So it's a very active area of research of how we can really identify the best treatment for an individual patient, which is most likely to work for them. So just to show you a little bit of how PDL1 is used, this is a protein that's expressed on the surface of cells, and you can see in the panels from, uh, from right to left um, that you can have no expression in tumor cells to very high expression in tumor cells, and at least in lung cancer, again, that those who have the highest levels of expression are more likely to benefit, but not 100%. This predicts for about a 50% chance, those, the, that end panel, of benefit, there's still a lot of people who may have high PD-1 that don't respond. There may be other things going on in their immune microenvironment that's stopping the response. 
And you know, the more we uh, study this, the more we know that all these immune factors that we've known about for a long time are probably paying roles as well, that it's not as simple as one interaction. PD-1 is not the whole story. There are many different in factors in the immune in microenvironment that can contribute to uh, the defense for tumor cells against immune attack. But it does provide opportunities for how we might improve upon PD-1 or PD-L1 monotherapy and uh, generate more benefit for more patients. So uh, this is just an example of a combination which is being studied in lung cancer, which is actually approved in melanoma, which combines a CTLA-4 inhibitor, ipilimumab, with nivolumab. And we see that you can see in the blue, those blue bars that at every level of pd one expression, we get better chances of benefit when you combine the two drugs together than if you're just giving the nivolumab alone in red. However, um, combining therapies, as we've learned from other types of therapies in cancers, can result in more side effects and more toxicities. And ipilimumab, historically, has been associated with more risk of inflammatory toxicities. In lung cancer, a lot of the focus has been on how can we change the doses of these and combine them in different ways to minimize the chance for side effects and maximize the chance for additional benefit. And we're certainly making headway in that regard. Um, but CTLA-4 inhibitors are not the only potential partner. There are so many different potential partners, both in other inhibitory signals that can be combined with PD-1, which is what you see on your left, um, and activating signals, which can be combined with PD-L1. And all of these, and there are many more than what's represented on this slide, are active areas of investigation, um, active ongoing trials, which some of you may even be participating in now. So in addition to combining uh, PD-1 inhibitors with other potential immunotherapies, the success that we've seen in this area has sort of revitalized the potential for boosting immune response in many different ways. And specifically, and I think hopefully we'll talk more with our panel about this, but vaccines, which have had a long history but few successes on their own, are getting new life as well with um, these with PD-1 and PD-L1 inhibitors, which are commonly referred to as checkpoint inhibitors, because really one of the theories behind why we haven't seen as much success with vaccines as we would hope to is that the tumor um, cells at the level of the tumor are sort of blocking that immune response. Even if you give somebody a vaccine and it has a lot of potential to stimulate T cell activation, that when the T cells are really in the tumor, around the tumor, they're not able to attack the tumor because of that force field around there. So maybe combining vaccines with PD-1 inhibitors would actually allow them to be much more successful. And that's an um, approach that's being studied, and we've already seen some successes with that approach. Chemotherapy can also generate inflammation, can generate new signals for a cancer cell to be recognized by the immune system by lysing cancer cells and releasing proteins. And we hope that those are combinations that could be successful too, and we've seen some of that in lung cancer already. Radiation can cause inflammation. Surgery can cause inflammation. These are all um, ways that we could potentially boost the immune response. And now, again, I think we're getting sort of a whole new... Um, window opening onto potentially expanding the success from that 20% of patients that get a benefit with PD-1 inhibitors to how can we combine PD-1 inhibitors with other things to really maximize the benefit for more patients. And that's sort of what's depicted on this um, hypothetical slide, um, which sort of shows you on your right where we are now. The black line is where we've historically been with chemotherapy that we might make a, a small amount of difference for some time for patients, that, but patients with metastatic cancer are still often dying of cancer. The blue line is actually with targeted therapy, where for a subset of patients, we delay that for longer, but their resistance develops as well, and we aren't getting long-term cures with targeted therapy. The red line is PD-1 monotherapy, where we are seeing that, quote, tail of the curve, long-term survivors of cancer therapy, but it's still a smaller proportion than what we'd like to see. The curve on the left sort of shows where we would like to be, with hopefully with combination therapy, with sequencing of therapy, other therapies, where basically we're generating long-term survivors of cancer for all patients, that all patients are going to get that long-term survival benefit. Um, um, I think some slides were maybe taken out of this. So I was going to sort of um, mention, but maybe we'll talk about this in the panel discussion, about... Uh, CAR T cell therapies, which are really a completely different avenue, but also extremely successful avenue of, um, uh, of research that has recently been approved, very recently, actually, just as of August 31st in leukemias. But these are approaches that, again, take advantage of um, historical approaches to using your immune system to attack cancer, but have improved upon them to generate much more success. So adoptive T cell transfer, which is the principle behind CAR T cells, really tries to use um, 
T cells to uh, stimulate uh, an immune attack in a patient, which can be either from modified T cells or a patient's own T cells um, that are modified outside the body and then put back. CAR T cells stands for chimeric antigen receptor or T cells from a patient's own body that are modified to recognize a very specific antigen that we know might be linked to that cancer type, amplify that response outside of the body, and then put them back into um, the patient. And we've seen really phenomenal successes with that approach in hematologic or blood-based cancers. It's an active area of research in solid cancers as well. Um, We've just seen the recent approval of that therapy, and hopefully it's the beginning of much more to come. Uh, This last slide is, I think, just some resources about uh, about cancer immunotherapy because I really touched on the very um, minimum here, but hopefully that this is a starting point for you to learn more. And maybe I could invite the panel up so we could get some of that discussion going as well.